find me inviting Mr. Alok Koloska, the director, Koloska Brothers Limited, and the CEO, the young CEO of Koloska Brothers International, BB, and Ms. Rama Koloska, the director on the board of Koloska Brothers Limited, and the charming managing director of Koloska Ivara Pumps Limited. Now, as we request uh, your utmost attention to this session, may I request the uh, hotel people to please close the door. If you can just please close the door, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with uh, the young dynamic minds present here on the stage and I hand over to the moderator of the session, Mr. Sharma, for the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I request you all to uh, settle down. We are starting the conversation in the next 30 seconds. Please do take your seat. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for uh, being here on a momentous occasion at a time when the average age of a company is 18 years to celebrate the establishment of 100 years of any enterprise across the world is a great achievement. And I think we need to dwell on this and reflect on this for a few seconds that 100 years of incorporation is, is a tremendous achievement. At a time and an era when companies come and go, you see them as meteors, they flash, they blind the world, but then they disappear. At the same time, you see companies based on only technological platforms who perhaps don't have any real world assets, they again seem to take over the world. But we are talking about a group and an enterprise which is rooted in engineering, technology and on-ground transformation of lives of people. Think also about the fact that in the last 100 years, KBL has gone from building iron clouds to augmented reality. And again, look at the span of technology which it has created, leveraged and offered to the world, not just to India, offered to the world. I think it's in this backdrop that we, we have to look at the fifth generation of KBL, which is sitting right next to me. Uh, and look at what's going to happen next. So my conversation over the next uh, few minutes with uh, Rama and Alok is really going to be about the future. We're calling it a waterfront chat and the answer is very obvious. Why didn't we call it a fireside chat? Because you know, this company is about water, it's about liquids, it's about fluids and that is an absolute essential for life across the world. It's an everywhere issue. And a company that is committed to that, I think, is, is really offering something which the world needs. Raman Arok, my question to you is, the foundation for the next 100 years is going to be laid now, is going to be laid by both of you. How do you see the transformation of the group? Because the pace of change is far more rapid. Between the iron plow to, to augmented reality was, was 100 years, but perhaps from augmented reality something completely unanticipated can be maybe two years so yeah. you know i'll come to rama first and then to alok where do we see kbl in the next few years so you know pranjal there's so many changes that we notice if you see the current generation uh, my, my generation most most of them are attracted towards uh, asset less or asset light businesses uh, they want to rent not own so it's all about how we are going to shift our business models towards more subscription-based business models. That's the first uh, change. Secondly, we see that fields of study are expanding so rapidly. Uh, fields of study are converging. There are new fields coming. We notice, you know, after students graduate from college, they're already obsolete within four or five years because uh, there's so much more information coming into those fields of study. So that's one area that we have to focus on. Secondly is um, curiosity. Curiosity is going to be really key for companies to succeed in the future simply because of this aspect. 
uh, we're going to be obsolete very fast and it's only that love of learning that is going to keep us up to date with fields of with fields of knowledge and the ability to work in teams because no one's going to be an expert in everything you're going to need large teams to find interdisciplinary solutions and that's the way where our group is headed hello um, i think uh, like it was said earlier uh, there is definitely a movement in the way we um, are today uh, looking at consuming items and uh, with a lot more of people sort of, sort of using subscription services like you mentioned earlier uh, you know our models are changing the retail models are changing so is, is something going to change at kbl do you think that next 50 years and i'm sure the both of you are going to be responsible for the next 50 years at least how will the next 50 years look which direction can this go in because you know you you're based in london you're based here the group has a global footprint there could be a lot of exciting things which could happen absolutely i think i think it definitely directly affects us uh, because we have a retail business we have an industrial business uh, the retail business obviously like we said could move to subscription but the industrial business i think it also creates new products because today customers are understanding the value of carrying inventory in terms of spare parts or in terms of uh, downtime and all these new services like uh, predictive maintenance uh, diagnostics all these are now new services that a manufacturing company like say ourselves is able to add to products and uh, and this creates a whole new segment of products which are not just sold once but they are sort of keep you connected with the customer because i think going forward it's very important to be able to um, be a very significant part of the customer's mind space continuously how difficult do you think will it be for a legacy company like yours to be agile because what you're saying is that there has to be a constant change in business model you have to approach the market in a new way maybe every 5 years in that context is being a legacy company a problem or is it going to help you i think uh, it'll clearly help us because the first thing for such models is that people need to trust you and i believe with the brand we get that trust uh, i think the next part is is a little harder for older companies which is generating new ideas and here i believe that having good teams motivating people uh, having environments that stimulate people within team, within within companies uh, especially older companies like ours uh, is very important because that's what will generate ideas you know almost like a startup environment uh, so, so you know that's a great point uh, uh, Rama, how do you create a startup kind of atmosphere in a hundred-year-old company? You know, you know, Pranjal, I'll want to step back. You'll have um, to speak louder. I'll want to step back to answer that question. Uh, I'm not sure whether you know, but KBL already operates with um, multiple different models, business models even today. So we have a mass-produced model, we have a um, uh, industrial model, and we have an infrastructure model. So it already has three different business models within the same company. So this is not something new to us. And I believe that is what is going to make this transition to uh, changing the models a lot easier for a company like ours. And the same is said of innovation. You know, your, your focus is on technology alone. Innovation is seen to be the preserve of small companies. You know, small startups, younger companies, close-knit groups, large groups, tend to acquire the smart companies. They don't tend to be smart themselves. Hmm. Is that something that you have as a plan for KBL that perhaps if I don't have innovation internally, then I will look for the best innovation and then get it on board? I think definitely we'd look at technologies from outside. But I believe that operating in many segments, it's very easy and I guess it's, it's apt that we would understand what the problems are in different segments. And because of that, we are able to understand, let's see what's happening in water, process fluids, etc. And I think that's quite similar for other companies, which are able to, uh, because I think the important thing here is having the right sort of teams, uh, being able to stimulate people. If you're able to do that, uh, I don't think it matters so much what the size of your company is, because your people are in the field, they understand what's going on, they understand ideas, they have accountability, and, and they feel a connection to the company. And I think those are what's important because like I said earlier, the startup environment, I think a startup doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, I would say most of them have pipe dreams, uh, but all of them have this passion to create something new and they feel a connection 
to the organization. And I think that's something that we need to build in older companies because we already have the other two points, which most startups don't have. So I think, and the, I think the third most, or fourth most important point that we do have and we can provide is continuity. A lot of startups, like you said, exist to be bought by someone. Uh, and so people don't necessarily at different levels, except for the they, senior. They want to be born to be acquired. Yeah, right? exactly. They don't, want to, they don't want to be born to sort of do the long haul and create an institution. They want to be acquired as soon as so that they get the return on investment as soon as possible, yeah. which, is, which is a very short term outlook in many ways. Yeah, but that's how most startups are. And I think that's a benefit that a company like any old company that can sort of stimulate its people, have that environment, uh, it has def a clear edge over most startups. I think, unfortunately, most large companies are not able to do that. And, and there's, 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 an there's another dimension. You know, family-owned companies or family-managed companies are also seen as a bit more conservative. Uh, is that a view that you share, Rama? I don't believe uh, we as a family have been conservative. I believe we've always been uh, ahead of the curve and we've always innovated. We've not uh, waited for adversity to hit us and uh, force innovation. I think uh, many times, in fact, I'll go to the other extreme and said we've been so enthusiastic to change <laughs> that a lot of times we have uh, brought on adversity because of, because give of me, that. Give me an example of that, where well, you went and you know, created trouble for yourself. Well, I think Alok can elaborate because he was there when we went into the construction business. Yeah, I think uh, so. You were not yet joined, for anybody, right? I remember when we had entered this construction business, we thought uh, it's a great idea because it's just an extension to pumps. But uh, it's it's a totally different business, and I think uh, it's 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 stuff like this. Very often we feel that you know we can add value in places, and sometimes you just need to accept you can't add value everywhere. There's some areas you need to stick to because you have domain knowledge there, and better to stick to your domain knowledge and develop around it. I would say. As you asked earlier, your first question, I think, was about technology. Uh, I think for us, we were already very asset heavy, or most old companies that are already very asset heavy. It's very easy for them now to have this asset light model that sits on top, uh, to be able to sort of expand and, and from a financial point of view, get, give a better return on capital employees. But that's a great point, you know, and I'll come to this, I'll defend family businesses for a bit because there are several studies which show that, you know, enlightened family-owned businesses tend to have a better long-term return on capital and investment simply because they are not bound by quarterly numbers. CEOs, and with due regard to all the CEOs present in the hall, sometimes are you know, driven only by quarterly numbers. And if they can meet eight quarters and they're happy, they don't care about the next 20 quarters. So perhaps that, that brings in a sense of stability, right, Raman? Right, no, I, I agree. I mean, there is a mundane aspect to business and then there's a strategic aspect and I believe we balance both out quite well. Do you think that uh, the families have a longer term vision than perhaps professional and CEOs? Um, absolutely. I think uh, that, that's a generalization, but I would say yes, most families have a, a more long term focus uh, because uh, at the end of the day, yes, they are delivering to a shareholder, majority shareholder. But uh, I think the objective is that they want to stay in business for as long as possible because the longer they stay in business, the better it is for the major shareholder. You know, here the issue of values and culture comes in uh, because a company which has survived and thrived and grown uh, across the world cannot have done it without a very strong framework of values, without a strong framework of culture, which binds the people together and which is what you've been uh, referring to. Is that something which is uh, uh, going to continue in a sense that you see a redefining of that? We're also, you know, looking at companies which have collapsed because they didn't have a value framework. How critical is going to be values framework for, for the group? No, I think it definitely is uh, one of the, you know, it's actually a foundation on which this group was built. So value system is definitely going to be extremely important for us. But I'd also like to highlight that we have uh, compromised growth because of that value system. And uh, many times there were many uh, growth opportunities we could have taken, but we've had to compromise because the business etiquette did not match our value system. But that's, that's very significant, Rama, because to be able to give up a business because you feel that it is wrong, even though your profit margins could be better, that's a very difficult decision. How do you even, you know, justify it to your stakeholders? Because I think sustainability is a value system for us, and that is, uh, you know, deep 
the one and only value that we stand by and we possibly uh, sacrifice all the other values to ensure sustainability is there and long-term growth is ensured. I think also values and vision need to be connected because uh, values sort of give you the path that you need to travel along and automatically anything that doesn't fall on that path, you avoid. Uh, so I think those two are very well, are very connected and that's why it's very important, I believe, to have clear values, not just strong, but clear values as well. Because so how much of this, everyone. now I'm going to get a bit personal here, how much of these values have come from Sanjay? Because, uh, you know, I also want to talk to uh, you about Sanjay as a boss and Sanjay as a father. Uh, because when you say value systems, it's both personal as well as institutional. Now, where do you pick up these values from? From your father or from your boss? Um, I think, I, for, for me, I would pick them up from both. Uh, <laughs> because I think there's some values you pick up uh, at home and there's some that you pick up at business. So, Mm. No, definitely. I think the value systems are picked up uh, from my parents, and uh, it's not—it's not something that you can teach to somebody over a you know short period of time. You actually have to live with that value system and be uh, brought up in that value system to be able to abide by it. So definitely, then the family abides by it, and so does the business. So have you done something which uh, you know? Your boss and your father said you shouldn't have done that. I mean, have you made mistakes which you were pulled up for? Uh, I think we've definitely made mistakes. I don't know if we've made mistakes that violated the values. <laughs> so I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think my father gives uh, quite a free hand uh, to most people. Uh, he, as long as uh, he understands that they that they understand that they are accountable for their actions. Um, I think with that he allows a lot of freedom and when you have a lot of freedom uh, and, uh, and direction, although a lot of his direction is implicit rather than explicit, uh, when a lot, of it, a lot of it is implicit, you do make mistakes sometimes. And, and in a company, sometimes mistakes cost money. But there could be occasions where, you know, you took a stand and you said, look, I think that's the right way to do and perhaps that turned out to be well as well. Well, you know, my father has very explicitly told me that the decisions have to be mine, but if, there, if I make a mistake, he's always there to back me. And I think that is very comforting and that's the reason why we've all learned to take decisions on our own and it's been a great learning journey for, for me. You know, one of the values that the group has always had, which I noticed uh, uh, from, as all of you would have seen through the movies and, and the history of the company, is self-reliance. Uh, to make an iron plow at a time when there were only wooden plows, and to use, and, and uh, those of you who have not read the book would find a fascinating anecdote when, when you know, there were, the World War happened and there was lack of iron availability in the country. So, their great-grandfather, he went around looking for iron to build the plows. There was no iron anywhere. So he went and acquired used cannons, melted them and used those, that metal uh, for, for making the plows, which I thought was a fascinating piece, not only which, which embeds self-reliance, but also is about innovation. You know, even if there is a scarcity, you find a solution uh, out of it. And I'm also going to refer to what the Prime Minister said earlier about the fact that self-reliance and the theme of Make in India has to be embedded in the Indian industry's DNA. Uh, self-reliance, is there a challenge there today, uh, Rama? Because what we see today is that Indian companies, when they go abroad, they face challenges, but global companies, when they come in, they find it a relatively easier uh, place to do business. But do you think that Indian companies need a new dynamic and a new framework to become stronger within the country. Yes, of course. I think there are a, there's a huge potential for, for this. Uh, we notice that there are trade barriers put in place for Indian companies outside. Okay. And, and Pranjal, there are not too many Indian companies like ours. In, in, and I say that because uh, we're one of very few Indian companies who are providing finished goods to uh, first world countries and um, we noticed that definitely there are trade barriers put in place uh, there are tenders we have come across that say uh, no products will be accepted from india or china uh, in other in other countries you have uh, local but this is important we, we don't hear too much about this that when indian companies go abroad and bid they are told that indian and chinese companies are not allowed to bid if somebody said that in india that certain countries companies are not allowed to bid you know there would be global furor so this is, this is a very important fact which I think 
the government and industry have to come together and work towards. Yes, of course. And, you know, if you look at Saudi Arabia, UAE, they all have uh, local content requirements. So, you know, companies like us are not even allowed to quote or participate in, in tenders if we don't have 80% value addition done in those countries. And that's essentially to promote employment in those countries. So uh, there's a good opportunity for India to do something similar simply because we have such a large population and uh, manufacturing provides so many blue collar jobs. So it would be great for our people. And you know, uh, and remember, Alok, you were telling me earlier that being based in London with companies uh, which are incorporated uh, in Europe and other parts of the world, when you bid, it's sometimes easier for you to do that, right? Absolutely. I think, uh, and I think that's a point that I wanted to make uh, a little earlier. That you know, when uh, the two things, I think one is that India also needs to start adopting some of the global standards. Um, today, we have adopted English, we have ad adopted ISO standards, but the more standards we adopt, uh, it makes it easier for us to assimilate it to the world, firstly. Uh, the, se the second and quite important point that goes with that is that, you know, every year we have close to one million engineers being added to the workforce. And if we're able to sort of train these engineers for audits, etc., for these global standards, we'd be able to work even better with a lot of the global EPC companies, construction companies, or, you know, variety of industries, depending on what standards we adopt. But the more global standards we are able to adopt, the better we are integrated into the world standards, right. is what I, I mean. I'll just pause both of you here. We'll be taking, you know, I'd love to have some of the thoughts uh, and questions from uh, you in the audience. So please keep your ideas ready. We'll just come back to you. There'll be some mics. Uh, we should be rolling around. So please do uh, keep your ideas and questions ready for uh, Rama and Alok. So, uh, competitiveness then becomes an important piece and technology plays a very critical role. I remember 70s, 80s and all of you uh, senior uh, industry leaders and policy makers present here would remember the time when we had to go and get into technology transfer agreements where you had to buy somebody's technology. Today's world of the fourth industrial revolution and the rise of automation means that technology is more accessible. Nobody has, nobody controls artificial intelligence. It's up to us to create the solutions uh, uh, out of it. Do you feel that technology can make Indian companies more competitive? Hello? Um, absolutely. I think, uh, I think there's a big change from the 80s, 70s and 80s because today India is part of the global market. Uh, nobody is going to sell any Indian company any sort of technology anymore because they want to come to the Indian market themselves. So any Indian company that wants to remain in the market and export will absolutely have to develop its own technology, build its own supply base. And I think most companies are investing in those areas. I would say a lot of companies are investing in components and they're building high quality components into that, that go into other major finished products. And because it's difficult to, to manage a supply chain when you're making a finished product uh, and complex finished products. So I think it has started, but I definitely feel that India has a huge future in this area. What do you say, Rama? Uh, no, no, I, I, I would agree with what Alok said. I, I think that uh, these new technologies will help us to scale up and enhance our productivity. And we need to look at Industry 4.0 as a set of tools and not just specific to engineering industries, but I think we can use them across sectors, uh, textiles, weaving, handicrafts, really to scale up any, any kind of uh, skill set that we have in the country and create employment for our people. Right, so thoughts and questions from uh, all of you, if you uh, would like to ask or share an experience about uh, what the next few years could look like for Indian enterprises. Uh, please do introduce yourself. Right, the mic's next to you. So, hello. Hello, and uh, Rama, I'm BN Dalmia. Uh, so, when you... Can, can you hold it closer to you? Yeah, thank you. When you entered the business, were there uh, long-established employees who resisted uh, your entry? That's one. And, and, and two, if there were changes you wanted to make or implement, was there, how did you do it? Did you do it in a phased way uh, so that 
it reduced the resistance to change. Did you think about it? Uh, did you do it in stages? Or how did you do it? So perhaps Alok and then Rama. Go ahead, Thank you, Dalby, I yeah. think, uh, I'll, um, so, you know, when I joined the business, I'd say that, you know, um, there wasn't, a, you know, resistance, I, as you as you know, because you also run a very old company. Uh, in companies like ours, I think, is more, impl is more implicit than explicit. And it may be in acceptance of ideas or it may be in implementation of ideas more than explicit sort of uh, talk, etc. And I think that the only, you know, in organiza older organizations, and possibly this is one of the shortcomings in older organizations, uh, things have to be done slowly. And I think in phases, and you do need buy-in because uh, at the end of the day, you're a team, and those senior people have their teams, and there may be some very dynamic people in their teams, and, uh, and definitely people who respect them and will uh, you know, follow their direction. And so it's very important, I feel, that it is done in phases. Uh, it is it is understood by them why it's being done, and uh, and I guess you know sometimes it has to be pushed, unfortunately. But I would say most of the time, uh, when people understand the general vision, they understand the reason. Uh, most people go along with it, unless there is some issue in terms of their own immediate control. And if there is, then I think some discussions need to be had around that about how their uh, sphere of control uh, is either remaining the same or has been changed and there's a good reason why it's changed and how it may be better for them and i think that's that's something that uh, that that i guess i i that's the way i approached it uh, rama approached it differently i think rama? Hello, Uncle. That's that's a very relevant question. Um, when when I joined the business, there were a lot of changes uh, that I wanted to execute or implement in the company. Uh, but what what happened is that I realized the first few years went into creating an environment where change was possible. That itself takes a very long time. Um, some is just process changes. Others are people changes. But you know, for an old company like ours, we have very good people. They're very knowledgeable. They may not know how to use the latest tools and technologies. And a lot of times we had these familiarization programs where we made the older generation you know, work with um, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, looking at uh, various sensor-based technologies for the foundry and the factory. And I think uh, that did eventually um, you know, uh, enlighten them about the advantages because a lot of these technologies uh, make our lives easier. Uh, they make management a lot easier, and I think when they realize that, uh, you know, they are also more amenable to the change. So, isn't it? I think to build on his question, it's it's also about you having to earn your respect. You have to earn the spurs. You have to do enough to be able to get the teams to say, well, I respect what you're saying, and I respect the fact that you're coming in it with a new idea or a new approach. Was that a difficult challenge for both of you? Yeah, it was, it, it took some time, I think, to get people to sort of accept it. Because I think most of the time, a lot of people, and all of us do, I think, when we're in that in that space ourselves, think things are going fine and, you know, why should we change it? <laughs> and, and, uh, and there's someone else who comes in and says, hey, you know, this is a lot better. And very often to change something, especially in an established business, to change something uh, creates a risk, right? As against a startup where they have nothing to start with, right? So I think uh, adding risk is not something people like to do in established <laughs> business where there's regular cash flow. Right? Exactly. And so you have to create that risk or disrupt internally before you get disrupted from outside. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Any more thoughts and questions? Uh, Is it that they have been very articulate or is it that drinks are taking effect? <laughs> right, I see two hands at the table over there. So uh, I'll collect both the questions and then uh, come to Rama and Alok. Please do my, introduce yourself. My question to both uh, Alok and Rama. What keeps uh, sorry, you can you introduce yourself as well so that everybody gets to know I'm you? I'm Srinivas Dempo. Uh, is there anything that keeps you awake at night? And if yes, then what is it? Sorry, okay, that's a great question. Could you repeat is the there question? anything that keeps you awake at night these days? And if yes, then what is it? <laughs> and the answer should not be Sanjay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, there are a lot of things that keep keep us awake at night. I think. I mean, it's uh, it's it's fi it's finally like like we mentioned earlier, sustainability of the business through various business cycles. 
and uh, and you know we've gone through so many business cycles over hundreds of years and uh, when you have the previous generation managing through world wars and you know all these kinds of business cycles and then you have smaller recessions that give you stress sometimes you wonder you know that you know is there is there some shortcoming in yourself but uh, but but yes i think it's it's creating stable businesses uh, through all those business cycles that i think keeps keeps us awake at night because at the end of the day business is about stable cash flow and good pe and good teams and good people and and creating those i think are 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 difficult uh, especially today where there's so much change so quickly rama uh, you know uncle as i was telling pranjal uh, as i was mentioning to pranjal there's so many different business models within the company sometimes you know uh you have to be a bit of a split personality to be managing a retail business and a uh, infrastructure business on the other hand and i think that is something that uh, definitely uh, gives me a lot of stress many times uh because uh, you get confused and uh, you know there's a lot of chaos generally so uh, yeah that that does keep me so you know i'm going to take this opportunity to shrivas you are a you know pillar of indian industry as well what's your advice to both of them what would what should they do so <laughs> What 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 should they do so that they can sleep easy at night? You you put me on the spot. <laughs> I I do agree. I mean, you know, I like Alok's answer that basically sustainability is the key. And how do you keep uh, healthy cash flows in a company? Because we live in a very volatile environment. So one is how do you keep sustainable cash flows going on and expanding the business? And as Rama says, that many of our family businesses. are diversified businesses so do we have the capabilities within us to manage such a range of businesses so that's that's the key that you know i would say is is the biggest challenge that i face in my own businesses right thank you i think you 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 need a mentoring session with the uh, vishnu nivas later <laughs> right here please hi rama hi alok no new for okay. such a long time now i'm always being very very proud to see you what you are what is the company uh two points one is you know adversity creates opportunities can you hold the mic closer to you yes yeah you know adversity creates opportunities uh if you expand on that in your in your experiences of what went how and what created <coughs> that and along with that and also also correlated with your other points is that the difference between experience and a change and <coughs> non experience in a changing frame of reference you know i th i think that uh, th th that phrase may be very apt for us because the last uh, decade has been about adversities and um, we've had um, you know various issues in our projects business and uh, various issues in our overseas businesses um, and i think all those have reshaped the business completely uh, our indian business which was dominated as a prop to be a project business today is a 95% product business and 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 the same thing on the international side where we've sort of relooked at the markets we want to be in and sort of focused in certain markets because sometimes it's just better to be smaller and more profitable than be bigger and and just you know have this vanity so i think that we uh, we we have restructured ourselves with all these opportunities because at the end of the day uh, like shrinivas shrinivas uncle mentioned cash flows are the most important and uh, and i think that's that's something that has been our mantra for the last decade where you know we've gone through all these adversities and sort of gone through those cycles and uh, i guess cleaned up to be uh, i guess more sustainable i think that's 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 what that was i you know, rather than give individual examples which will take forever but i'll say that's that's basically what we've done over the last decade so the cash flow has to be as as efficient as the waterfall behind us right so Absolutely. it has to continue cuz the only difference would be of course digital cash is going to be more prominent but yeah. uh, rama what do you feel how would you respond to this question well i think uh, you know I'd, i've i've been more exposed to the domestic business and you know most of the adversities as far as the domestic business is concerned is access to market right most of our competitors most of the competitors that i have to deal with are either german or american mm -hmm. and i clearly notice that they have more access to market 
than Indian companies like ours. You're saying foreign companies in India have better access to Indian market than Indian companies? That is one, because they have proven track record. I mean, if, if you see the number of firsts KBL has had in India, um, and they were both during the British Raj and, uh, you know, very close to post-independence, uh, we were never asked for this proven track record to introduce products into the market. But now we notice that, you know, these very foreign trade barriers called proven track records have been put in place. And, and that is stunting the com growth of Indian companies like ours. So there is a feeling, and I think, uh, you know, all of you have, have great experience. Uh, there is a feeling that the way business is done in India, there is more respect, perhaps, or you know, more credence given to global companies and you say that, well, if this company is based in UK or in Europe or in US, then it's more likely to offer you better product quality and service rather than a company based in India. Is, is that a serious big challenge that we, you know, it's a mindset also we have to overcome? And if anybody yes. wants to add to this thought, please do, do come in. Yes, I agree. I agree with you. I think there's still a lot of uh, public sector companies and also private sector companies that have a preference or believe that a foreign product may be better. And I mean, to be fair, a lot of lot of us possibly also want to buy a foreign automobile or whatever else, right? But so, made in India, you know, many of these foreign automobiles are made, made in, in India. India. Yes, yes, or assembled in India, yeah. And I think that that's another point, right? I mean, uh, the UK has something called patent box. And patent box is sort of there to help you design in the UK. Correct. And if you design in the UK, you get a much lower tax rate on those products. Uh, that's something that India should look at because rather than just screwing together things in India, I think it's also important that we design in India and in and the IP is owned in India. And I think you're, you're setting very good examples on that front. Any other thoughts? We have about a couple of minutes left. Uh, okay, I see two hands, uh, three hands. Okay, so we'll, let me collect the questions and I'll come to you. Hi, my name is Subhala Das. And, uh, this Can is you hold the mic closer to you? Thank Hi, you. Subhala Das from uh, Pune. Uh, this question for Alok and uh, Rama. The invitation card for this evening event mentioned uh, the new foray into the next century. How important is it and how do you, both of you plan to go back to school to learn the pace of this change which you are witnessing? Okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Das. I'll come to you. I'll collect the questions and I'll come to both of them so that we can be a bit more efficient with time. Uh, can we have one mic to the lady here? And, uh, uh, Pradyumna Vyas, former director, National Institute of Design. Um, the company has 100 years of legacy and that has created a value system. And we are in the fourth industrial revolution where um, it's very disruptive, physical, digital, biological boundaries are merging. Uh, manufacturing setups are getting into service sectors. And this is the big shift which is happening that manufacturing to service. And when the legacy of 100 years is there, a new business model where future is fiction, anything is possible, how the young generation is really looking into that uh, where lots of opportunities are there, at the same time, legacy is also there. So how we uh, balance the two. Uh, make this, balance these two? Absolutely, great question. Yeah, so I have a similar question, which is basically you're a 100-year-old company and, uh, uh, okay, you're a 100-year-old company and uh, also the rate of, uh, the pace of change is, is becoming much faster. So where do you see yourself? 10 would be too close, but maybe 20 years from now. And my second question is your siblings. So do you guys like, do you see a similar future or do you argue a lot like all siblings? I mean, do you fight? How does it go? I mean, what are your dinner time conversations? So, that's, that's a great question. So I'm going to, you know, this is more about the family and, and uh, uh, the first theme of the questions are about the 100 year legacy and how do you plot the future, which is what we started the conversation with. Do you feel the need to go back to school? You have terrific academic careers as well, but do you think that in the age of fourth industrial revolution, you have to rethink everything about KBL, think of something new, so maybe have a 20 year plan for it or a you know 50 year vision for it, so I don't know. Perhaps both of you could uh, take a stab at it. I think that yes, you know, when you say go back to school, I think it's sort of going back to an environment uh, where you're able to sort of touch back with people now back in their 20s or you know late teens uh, to understand how the markets are changing. Because like we said earlier, I think people are moving to uh, moving from a tangible-based business to intangible businesses, and we need to also understand how that shift can be made. Not that we want to become an intangible business, but how is, how does that part of the business fit onto our 
tangible, asset-heavy business because that's, that is the future. But we don't need to let go of the asset-heavy business that we already have because someone has to do that. Uh, you know, you can't have just these asset light businesses going for another hundred years. It's not possible. You need to have uh, you need to have those assets, and we already have those assets. So there's no reason for us to dispose of them. Uh, but, but as you said, the business model may change yeah. while the assets may remain. The business model will change with the current assets. And I feel that yes, going whether I should go back to school, yes, we should go back to a kind of school that puts you back in touch with uh, the next the next generation, I guess, after us, so that we know where the markets are moving because that's most important for companies, old companies, and most companies. We need to all understand where the markets are moving, and we need to ensure that we plan for that ahead of time. So it's also you know what what we are really talking about is at a time that while its assets remain where it is, its roots remain very strong. At some point, there's also a need for reinventing the company for the next 50 years. Because whatever you did in the past 100 years may not be as relevant because you have to think about what's going to happen in the next 1500, right? So, you know, like Alok said, Pranjal, that um, ultimately we're not virtual beings, right? We need tangible products. And um, that, that is where companies like us come into the picture. Secondly, is going back to school, yes, definitely required because uh, disruptions can come from any field these days. Uh, fields of study are converging. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, the, the, the. I don't know whether you've heard of this, but uh, there's a new field called biomimicry, where uh, you know they're borrowing from biology and applying it to engineering, and that's how the Chinese built one of the fastest trains on the planet. Uh, was actually by mimicking uh, how a, a kingfisher dives uh, into water, right, at, at such a, a fast pace. Uh, so, you know, these kinds of things are always going to come up. There are going to be changes in materials, changes in technologies. And um, yes, we have to keep learning in order to keep pace with the times. So final question to build on what was said earlier. How do both of you work together? Uh, do you WhatsApp each other? You know, I'm facing this problem. Give me some thoughts and advice. Give me a quick uh, tip on this. Or, or how do you, you know, while you're running independent companies in two very distinct geographies and very distinct markets, how do you work together? Well, I think the learnings from each market is very different. So we definitely, uh, there's a lot of dynamic learning. You know, he might learn something, I might apply it and vice versa. So that does happen a lot of times. And um, of course, I learn a lot from him because he's been in the business for uh, quite a few years uh, more than me. So um, yes, we do do a lot of WhatsApp chats, uh, dinner table <laughs> conversations. Um, we do argue uh, quite a few times. But I think the goal is, is, uh, is shared. But approaches may or may not be, be the same. Hello? I, I agree. I think the overall vision is, is, is very similar. And uh, the, the thought process is very similar. Uh, yes, the paths to get there may not necessarily be the same, but they can't be the same for everyone. But I think it's most important that at the end of the day, both of us know where we want to head to and we want to be in a similar place. Uh, but you do both, both of you do believe that KBL for the next 50 and 100 years is going to be distinctly different, more enhanced than what it was. Do you Absolutely. both agree on that? Absolutely. I mean, it has to be. It has to be. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, let me, let me. Is it... I was asking you to join me to thank them and to congratulate them because I think there is clarity of thought. Uh, there is there's the clarity of vision on what, what is going to be in the future. Uh, and for any enterprise, not just uh, KBL, I think the fact is that in today's world, you have to reinvent yourself before somebody else forces you to be. And I think to that extent, uh, uh, we can all agree that uh, a KBL's future is in very strong hands. It's also rooted in tremendous history of innovation and technology. And I think we can all wish them a great next 100 years. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so very much uh, for this very interesting talk. In fact, you know, your uh, talk and your thoughts remind me of a song, Ki hum hai nahi, to andaz ho purana. <laughs> so you're bringing about a change, and this is, yes, a new transformed India where we are. We heard uh, the young leaders speak to us, sharing their uh, thoughts, their vision, their dreams, their passion as they take the company to greater heights. Thank you once again. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Rama. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Mr. Sharma.
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the closing of uh, the formal uh, ceremony which we have. The night stands young. We'll continue the celebrations. But as we formally conclude here, I would like to invite Mrs. Uh, Pratima Kaloska, the promoter of Kaloska Brothers Limited, to kindly propose a formal vote of thanks. And once again, reiterating, we'll continue rocking, celebrating the evening. Uh, so remain at your seats. There are moments in time when one gets to witness history in the making. Even rarer are those moments when one gets to live in it. I am fortunate to be standing here today on this momentous occasion, looking at the glorious hundred years of the legacy of Kirloskar Brothers Limited. The legacy which began with Sri Lakshman Rao Kirloskar continues to be carried forward by the fifth generation now. Sanjay and I have tried to hand down to our children, Alok and Rama, who represent the next generation of the Kirloskars, all the values and virtues that we have imbibed from our past generations and our learnings in our own lifetime. But each generation will add to this pool of knowledge with their own unique experience, skill set, and acumen, culminating to what we will see tomorrow. Looking at the remarkable 100-year journey of Kirloskar Brothers Limited, I can't but thank those people who have made it possible for us to see today. It's time to say thank you to all of them. I would like to thank each and every member of the Kirloskar Brothers Limited family for their dedication and, and drive. Even today, our company has many third and fourth generation employees, vendors, and sales partners. The journey of 100 long successful years wouldn't have been possible without their invaluable contribution. I would like to especially thank the past and present directors of Kirloskar Brothers Limited for their time and effort to be here to celebrate the great achievement of KBL. Without your guidance in the past and present, this narrative would have been incomplete. I would also like to thank all the teams from KBL, the Taj Palace team, and Pros Integrated for planning and putting together this event. But lastly, and not the least, I thank each one of you who are present here for joining in our celebration and making this event happen. Before ending, I would like to urge you all to join us for dinner and enjoy a musical evening with Pandit Bikram Ghoshji and his team of musicians. So dinner will be served at your table. Thank you. May I invite Mr. Pranjal Sharma on stage. Sanjay would like to give you a small memento. Thank you so much, Pranjal. And, so, and those are the stamps again. The three stamps of Kirloskar Brothers. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to be taking some time to set the stage for the musical evening. But let's uh, raise a toast uh, to the success of Kaloska Brothers Limited. Let's raise a toast, uh, wishing them many more new happy beginnings and more successes and uh, congratulations coming from everyone. Uh, that's, uh, I hope you enjoy this evening. I'm sure you are going to be enjoying all the more as uh, we take this time to set the stage and then uh, we in fact uh, rejoice and celebrate over the beats of the tabla as the tabla maestro takes center stage please enjoy your dinner as the dinner is going to be served at your tables <laughs>